Ebenezer, it is so good to uh, have you with us and us be back together as a family. Uh, God has just been so good to us. And I just think about all the things that he has put in place that we can still stay connected in this uh, strikingly different world of this time, but still uh, the same because we can still share Christ and souls can be saved and be brought to the knowledge of the truth of him. So I'm gonna ask Bianca, so good to have you uh, back with us, if you would open us up in prayer. Father, we just praise you and thank you for this day and for all the wonderful things that you've done. I ask that you would be with us through this Bible study, let your Holy Spirit just lead us and guide us and bring us to all truth. We praise you and thank you for meeting us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, just some announcements as always, uh, ebcnc.com. Thank you so much for uh, continually uh, going back to that. Uh, don't forget about just your giving part, the ebcnc.com. You got a little button up there, the Tively app. Y'all just been doing great or sending in uh, your gifts to our secure mail, secure mailbox and to all our leaders just for all that you do just got so many fresh things going on on the website also don't forget about the calendar that's there and don't forget about just the testimonies connect just a lot of fresh uh, material that we try to keep up on that website also uh, for some of you uh, you may just be in our wednesday night bible study but we have several bible studies that are going on during the week I want to call out on our Mondays. Each Monday we have uh, some fresh material that's there. We have our second and fourth Mondays, which is our topical Bible study, where we choose a topical uh, topic that we've been going through evangelism. And then on the other Mondays, we may have men's Bible study that's there, which everybody's welcome now. Uh, also, Minister Barry is doing that, did an excellent job on our last one. And um, Cinda does the women's ministry when uh, she has material to put up there. Or we have marriage. We are actually going to have a marriage one on the fifth Monday. So God is really blessed with that, uh, keeping up material there uh, as we go forward. Don't forget about uh, just our activities on Sunday. We have some for our youth at 1 o'clock, or 18 to 35, excuse me, at 1 o'clock. And then at 3 o'clock, we have some for our younger adults. So we're just trying to keep up the fellowship connection. But also want to thank you for what you're doing. You're reaching out this web. Uh, we've become a church without walls. I'm excited. I'm excited about what God is doing. Uh, he is increasing our faith. We're having to put our faith and trust in Him. And just be patient during this time. We'll, we're going to get back to some sense of normalcy uh, eventually, uh, but I think it's going to be a longer season than any of us anticipated, especially as summer is running short. And then we're going into that fall season where, uh, as many of you know, we have to deal with flu and flu and COVID. I, I just, I'm just praying. I'm like, God, please give us some relief with that. So we just want to use wisdom as we go forth. Pray for all the families that are going through a lot of bereaved families uh, during this season and time. Our Bible reading plan, Psalms 99, 101. Please keep on pressing ahead. If you're behind, don't give up. Hey, just keep at your pace. Maybe there's some days you can put in a little extra reading. Bianca, if you give us our quote from Charles Spurgeon. Some Christians try to go to heaven alone, in solitude. But believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks, and so do God's people. Amen. And during this season, it's been challenging, but thank God for the internet. He's used that. Um, our spirits have been together. We've been able to see each other in Walmart and other places and uh, sadly at funerals. So we've been connecting that way. Even in the time of social distance and masks, we can still say hello. We can do air hugs and um, send letters. Mm -hmm. Send letters, reaching out to people. I got this beautiful letter the other day. It just blessed me. Uh, let some, somebody know that I was, they were thinking about me, uh, emails, so many other vehicles and ways that we can reach out. And I, I would say in, in a lot of times we can share our hearts uh, in those ways, in different ways than we were able to do before. Uh, so uh, God has blessed us really challenging times to really dig deep and know um, the God that we serve. As we get into Deuteronomy, an exciting lesson tonight, uh, building up 
remember Moses, this is a proclamation to the children of Israel. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. Um, they're learning um, the challenges that they're going to go through, the temptations that they are going to many times fail. But Moses, via God's voice, is speaking to them uh, to lay out ways to uh, not getting to these, these dark places. So the Lord will bless you if you obey. We talked about don't forget the Lord. Uh, we talked about even loans. God speaks through Moses about loans, sacred promises to the Lord. Uh, we dealt with the law about divorce. Uh, we got into newlyweds and how God saw that. Uh, we dealt with loans again, and I think that's important. I left that because he continually he repeats himself. We talked about pure, poor people's wages, and we even got into the death penalty. I told you from last Wednesday, we're going to talk about tonight when two men fight. Now, this is interesting to me. There is a lot of kind of stuff we got to navigate through here, but uh, I, I want you to just pay close attention and I want you to try to think, okay, so how can we make semblances to the New Testament? What is this speaking to us? So Bianca, if you start us out. Deuteronomy 25 verse 11. If two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the genitals, then you shall cut off her hand your eyes shall not pity her. Oh my, oh my. Bianca, what's your thoughts on this scripture? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like there's a lot going on in the scripture. First of all, um, the fact that she would, and I've been, you know, guilty of this, try to rescue her husband, whereas her husband, as the head of the household, should be able to handle things himself. So I guess if anything, she probably shouldn't have intervened in the first place. She probably should have just been in prayer or gotten somebody else to help. But then second of all, um, I mean, there are plenty of places I guess she could have reached for. <laughs> so to reach for that place just, I don't know, says a lot about what's going on. And so I guess the thought is that, um, I don't want to say, she, fight fair but that's kind of what I'm thinking that you know it's bad that she's punished in that way but it's it also makes her think of, take a second thought about what she's going to do if she intervenes at all. Wow she actually hit it and I, I told her earlier I was like I'm coming at you Bianca you're going to have to deal with that. this scripture so let me get into this commentary it is a lot of levels if a woman interfered by seizing a man's immodestly in a fight in which her husband was involved, her offending hand was to be cut off. Her actions might endanger, listen to this, the man's having an heir, thus the severe penalty. So uh, as Bianca brought out, this is very serious offense. So two men are fighting, the wife intervenes, and literally she's, she's going for blood, literally. She, she's like, okay, I'm gonna fix it so that you won't have any heirs. And heirs were so important in that community. And so God took this very seriously. Uh, it seems like a very stringent um, act that was put forth, but in that season and time, that was laid out. And so as we think about in our lives, first of all, the correlation, thank God for grace. How many times have we done things? Um, and we just didn't think about the implications, how this could affect. It just came to my heart, you know, a child's growing up and you may say something to a child that, you know, you're stupid or you're dumb. And you're like, ah, oh, they'll be fine. But you don't know, at least in that time in their psyche, how that's going to mess with them, how that's going to deal with them and uh, their mentality as they're growing up. And so we as Christians in this season and time, we cannot allow our anger to cause us to do things that's going to hurt someone past that moment and maybe even hurt them, their generation, hurt their family, their kids. And so God puts a lot of responsibility into us. And please understand the enemy is always looking for a way to steal, kill, and destroy. Very important. The next part Remember, on last time I told you we'll be piecing a whole bunch of parts together uh, within the scripture, and that's how God just laid it out. So he goes from this severe judgment, and he goes, be honest in business. And so that's where we're coming also. As the woman attacked that man, 
her honesty level. Why was she doing it? What, what was the whole process? And so now we talk about business, Deuteronomy 25 and 13. You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. So with all these scriptures, God is looking at the heart. What's in our heart? Why do we make choices? Why do we do what we do? Oftentimes you can do something, it looks good to everybody else, but if your heart's not right, and here God is examining the purposes. On his weights and measures were required. Often men had one set of scales for buying and another for selling. This was an abomination to the Lord. So they, they would, they would just switch the scales and God was like, this is dishonest. This is deceiving the people for your own gain. God hates that and we have to be very careful. Uh, those who are in business and your salesmen and saleswomen, be very careful that you're not manipulating people. You're not just trying to pad your pocket, not caring. Uh, even as leaders in the church, we have to make sure that everything is in God's will, that we're not manipulating people. And it saddens me. I've been to so many places where I see manipulation at a high level, and it just hurts my heart. So we have to be sincere, stay with what God uh, says so that we don't get caught up in this type of acting, this type of hypocrisy uh, that God hates so much. Now let's get into another <coughs> section, uh, wipe out Amalek. God has given severe judgments and sometimes it's hard to understand when you just read through it. Um, there has been many attacks upon uh, the Christian church because of some of these Old Testament scriptures. So we're going to try to do our best to explain them in a way that these work contextually to the Old Testament, but they do have some spiritual comparisons. Let's look at Deuteronomy 25 and 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Bianca brought out earlier that there are levels. When we were talking about that first scripture we started out with, there are so many levels. I'm finding out, I'm just learning, when, when we deal with God, He doesn't just deal with what we can see right now, but he deals with generations. He deals with backgrounds. He deals with our thoughts, our choices, what's happened in the past, all of that. Um, God commands Israel not to forget Amalek. This nation had attacked the weary, the aged, and the children when Israel passed through its borders. God abhorred this despicable act and commanded Israel to completely blot out Amalek. All the times that I'm dealing with people, I think about the mistakes that I made. And I, I'm very, and I, I go before God and I go, Lord, thank you for your grace. Because I know God doesn't owe me anything. You know, we all have sinned and fallen short of the kingdom. And in here, this is one specific thing. God looks back to the past and he's like, Amalek, that whole generation, they were mean people. They attacked the weary, the aged, the children, uh, aged and the children when Israel passed through his border. And God, this was despicable. And so God says there must be judgment that comes upon that. And as we look at our lives, I think all of us just got to thank God for his grace and mercy that things are as well as they are. If we got what we deserve, any, I, whew, that, that's a heavy thought. If we really got, I'm talking about your whole life, if you got what you deserved, because God knows your heart. So I'm just thanking God for his grace. This next part takes us to another level. Egypt typifies the world that God's people were to flee. Amalek typifies the flesh that hinders God's people from leaving the world. 
Now, this is curious. So we see those spiritual implications here. We see Egypt. We see Amalek. We see God making these symbols of the things that we're supposed to flee, that we're supposed to get away, away from. Balaam had prophesied that when the uh, scepter would rise out of Israel, referring to the coming of the Christ, he would have complete dominion, Numbers 24:20. Then Amalek would perish forever. In this way, the Bible promises that when we receive our glorified bodies, we will no longer have difficulties with the flesh. Thank God for that. So all of these, remember Balaam, Amalek, the prophecies that went forth with Israel, and then the gross sin, immorality that came after that. So God does not forget judgment. Remember that scripture we talk about so often, the wages of sin is truly death. But don't want to forget that last part. The gift of God is eternal life. And I'm so glad, again, for Jesus. Now let's talk about giving in the Old Testament, how it was. Um, so many people have used this in various ways. But I just love just how God deals with that. So we're going to talk about give to the Lord the first part of your harvest. And we want to think about our lives. So Deuteronomy 26 and 1. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Now within this scripture, it comes easier to understand if you are a farmer, if you have been raised in a family agricultural, because this was an agricultural society. This was the way their money kind of went across bartering. You know, you I'll give you three corn and you give me this. And so that was how things were kind of traded out. Uh, Bianca and I, we have a little garden. So I'm, I'm understanding it even more as we're growing that and how precious, you know, we, we got some corn, got a bounty of corn and got some, um, some little green beans and mm -hmm. things of that sort, some hot peppers. I'm just like, man, if this was our money, boy, we'd be like, okay, I, it would be, <laughs> it'd be oh, serious Lord. bartering because this is what we would be eating or trading off for someone else to eat. So as we look at this, it digs a little deeper. Moses commands the people to bring the first fruits of the ground and present them to the Lord at the place of worship as a symbol that they had finally conquered the land. Some scholars believe that this was a command to be followed only once. However, the first fruits were offered yearly on the day after Passover, Leviticus 23, 10-11. So the picture is God has blessed you. Remember, you can plant the seed, but only God can give increase. So as God gave an increase, you wanted to take that first part and you wanted to give it to the Lord. You wanted to offer it up to the Lord. Sometimes they would burn those. Sometimes they would lay those. When I was in Jamaica, I believe it was in Jamaica, they had a semblance of this. And so the people, it's, it's just so bountiful, beautiful land. They would take their fruits. And on Sunday, this Sunday, they brought all their fruits and vegetables and they actually put it at the altar. And it was a sacrifice unto the Lord. It was beautiful. It was, you know, you, you just saw all of these nice vegetables, all these nice fruit, beautiful colors just laying at the altar and they were offering them up to the Lord. And I think after that they gave them or distributed uh, those to the poor that were in the community. So God is just wants us never to forget where our blessings come from. And I guess we do that comparison in our lives. Bianca, what are your thoughts? How do we give of our first fruits? The obvious is our gifts of love that we give in, but how else can we give our first fruits? Um, just, I guess, in some ways, just by giving your best, giving your time. So many people say, well, I don't have time to help in the ministry. Well, that innocence can be your first fruit, is that you set aside some time to volunteer in the ministry and um, to, do, to do things um, for Christ. And then also things like, you know, when you give, give stuff away, a lot of times people are like, I'm not going to give that away, it's too good. Well, but if you don't need it and you're not using it, why wouldn't you give away something that's good? Why do we always have to give people, you know, our hand-me-downs? Why can't we give them something that is worthwhile and something that we would want to have? Good. That's, that's good. Uh, really examining our hearts. Deuteronomy 26 and 3, it says, And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to your fathers to give us. 
Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. So the priest was always involved in these transactions. Uh, he was a representative in a sense, or more of a gatekeeper for God, if we put it at that point. The first of the fruits were presented to the Lord in a basket made of wicker. And I, I put a little basket there, wicker basket. Just to be, if God was very specific. God said, just don't bring it to me. There is a way to bring it to me. So they were bringing a made of wicker, verses 2 through 4. The priest was not the high priest, but one who attended to the sacrifice of the altar and who received the sacrificial, sacrificial gifts. So there was always a designated person to take in. Uh, we remember when we were at Ebenezer in the walls, we did. We had uh, some wicker baskets and they had a little red velvet that was in there that we would take up our offerings in that. But imagine if all we had was fruit and we would bring that fruit and put it into that basket and present it to the Lord. When Israel made the statement, I profess this day unto the Lord, it was a confession of faith in God. The fruit was a tangible proof that Israel had occupied the land as they had been commanded. So as God blessed them, they were able to see the fruit that God allowed to produce. And so in our lives, I want you to start looking at the fruit. Bianca, what are some fruits that when we've done what God told us to do that we can actually see uh, sprouting up in our lives? Um, like you said, you know, maybe a promotion on your job, maybe um, something that you weren't able to get before, that you couldn't afford before, but now you can, you know, maybe... I don't know, before you got the store brand and now you can get the name brand or I don't know, things that, um, you know, maybe even an exercise, maybe you're starting exercise program and you started off, all you could do was walk, but now you can run three miles a day. So Good. increase. Increase. And we shouldn't take that for granted. Uh, and so often we do take God's increase in our lives for granted. The next part takes us to a, just a, another level. Also, the fruit was a practical confession that they were indebted to God for the gift of the land. We, we can never forget that it's God that has blessed us, that it's God that has increased us, that it's God that has given us everything that we have. It's not our educational level or because we're so smart on our job. It was God that gave us the health and strength. So we always want to put him first. And I encourage you, Never forget God. Never get caught up in yourself. Always put God first. A prayer of thanksgiving, B. As a prayer of thanksgiving, Israel recognized that her existence was based on the grace of God and manifested in a miraculous redemption out of Egypt. Wow. Don't want you to forget where God's brought you from. That's why we give. That's why we're so grateful because God has brought us through so many things. He's kept us through so many things. One simple thing, um, those that are, are COVID free, you can just thank God on a daily basis. Thank God it keep me COVID free. Mm -hmm. Thank God for keeping my family COVID free. Just a simple thing. I believe he's protecting us even as we're having to traverse this different world and the places that we're going. I believe he's covering us. I don't ever want to take that for granted. I don't want to ever take God's a presence in our lives for granted. So we have to put constant reminders. That's why giving is so important. That's why taking time to be holy is important, to realize and to pray and to give thanksgiving to God. And sometimes we do, we just run, 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 and we just don't slow down to say thank you. Big portion of scripture getting ready to jump into, uh, starting at Deuteronomy 26, five through 11. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian, about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you 
and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. So let's dig into this uh, scripture. Uh, the danger was not spiritual temptation, but the prospect of extinction. Although Abraham was the leader of a large tribe of at least 318 armed men, Genesis 14, 14, um, Jacob, 318 armed men. Jacob had only 70 souls with him when he went to Egypt, Genesis 46, 27. The reference is to Jacob rather than Abraham because Jacob was the father of the sons who led the 12 tribes. Also, the nation derived its name Israel from him. Jacob is called an Aramean because of his long stay in Syria, Genesis 29 through 31, and because his two wives and most of his children came from there. So a lot of history, a lot of background we're pulling into this. Um, and that's why it helps to read all of the Bible over and over again, that we can make these, correction, these connections and correctly uh, be able to expound on the scriptures. When an Israelite appeared before God and called himself an Aramean, it was a confession of his worthlessness and a testimony that he depended upon the grace of God. So Bianca, how do we make this comparison to the Christians now as we're living our lives going through, uh, they had a specific thing, they would call themselves the Aramean in subjection to God. How can we make that correlation now? I think that's every day. Every time we come to the Lord in prayer, we need to realize that the only reason we can do that is through the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ and not because of anything that we've done. And just to remember um, our former state before we met Christ and how he has brought us into our own promised land. And just to remember that it wasn't anything that we've done, but because of what he has done. So we come humbly, always humbly before the Lord. Amen. Thank God for Jesus again. We say that so much. The phrase, now behold, verse 10, signifies that the person made his confession before he brought the basket to God. So you realize God has given me increase. I am not worthy of the increase, but he has. And all of us, when you really think about it, we're not worthy of what God has done for us. But aren't you so glad that he's done that? So they would make this confession. Then Moses commanded you, shall said it before, uh, before the Lord, verse 10, meaning that after the confession, the basket was to be set down before the Lord. So we understand who we are. We're not worthy to bring this, but we want to thank God anyway for what he's done. And as we approach God, I think we do. We need to have that idea. Yes, he's made us king and priest and he's favored us and he's blessed us. But please know if it had not been for God, where does the favor come? Where, where does the blessings come from? It's all connected to the Lord, not really us. It's his grace and his mercy, his covering, again, what Christ has done for us. We're going to dig a little deeper in here. We're going to talk about percentages, 10% of the harvest. Uh, Deuteronomy 26, 12. When you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house, and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for in unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God, and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from, hev look down from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, the first thing, you should kind of feel that prayer that's coming through those scriptures. Moses commands Israel to deliver the tithe to the sanctuary or to the place of corporate worship. So we have a lot of semblances of that now, and now we have technology and we're able to give via a button on a website or an app or you know sending it into our secure mailbox. We have ways to give. But remember, in that community, it wasn't, again, it was a agricultural. So they were giving a percentage of everything that they had. He uses the phrase tithing all the tithes, which means paying all the tithes that are commanded 
after the tithes were paid, a person could say before the Lord God a prayer that an Israelite could make at any place. He was not necessarily confined to praying in the sanctuary. So this whole acknowledgement, God, I've done what you've asked me to do. And I'm not doing it just because you asked me, because I realize that you have blessed me with everything I'm given uh, you, you, you've already blessed me with, so it's really yours. I, I'm just recognizing who you are. This next part deals with a little bit more. He could invoke the blessing of God on his endeavor because he had obeyed God and had sanctified his house. Question is, can you invoke the blessings of God upon your endeavors because you've been obeying him? Not just in giving, but just in your life, uh, just seeking his face. Um, praying in his word, walking, pursuing righteousness and fleeing youthful lust. Are you able to process that and go, God, I invoke the blessings because I've tried to do the best I can. I'm not perfect. All of us have sinned and failed. But Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of me. The tithe was called holy. Holy. Just the tithe was called holy holy. This is beautiful. A person was to cleanse his house by delivering everything out of it that was tithe, i.e. every tenth head of cattle born, a tenth of the crops, a tenth of the profit, etc. Remember at that time, uh, it was literally a tenth of everything. We have, you know, singled out to our money, but God has increased us in so many other areas. And when we think about that, you're like, oh my Lord, God has blessed. So I want you to think about that. Some even brought in our time. You know, God gives us 24 hours in a day. How much of that do we give to the Lord? You know, so many, th so many, so many things that we could tithe off of and give back to the Lord that he's blessed us with. Increase that he has blessed us with. And so I want you to just be processing in your life. You know, how can you give even more to the Lord and his service and what he's done? Uh, Moses reminds them not to eat at the tithe or eat the tithe. They could not even use it to send as a provision to the house of a friend who was mourning uh, his death. That Henson brings all this commentary in. So Bianca, why do you think this portion of provision was put in that Old Testament? They couldn't just eat it, you know, or whatever. What, what's your thoughts with that? Because we as people always come up with excuses, we come up with reasons not to do what God has told us to do. And one of those would be, well, Lord, you know, um, you know, my friend is in mourning and they don't have any food. So you know, this would be a godly thing for me to do, to take this food that I'm supposed to be saving for you, but I'm going to give it to this family because they're in mourning, and um, I think they need it more than the poor do. And so we always come up with excuses for doing, for not doing what God tells us to do. It's a good thing, but it's not a God thing. Good. So we, we just have to be led of the Lord. <sighs> Allow God to examine our hearts and be open to his direction as we go forth. Um, some of our giving can even be giving that focuses on us. Remember uh, in the temple, Jesus was there and this lady came in and she gave just a little mite, a little penny, just dropped it in. And then the Pharisees and Sadducees they had big money and they were just putting it in. You know, you could hear the tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. And Jesus said, she, that woman, gave all that she had. She gave the greatest. So it wasn't how much it was about the heart. They were given so that they could be seen, so they could be celebrated, they could be lifted up, that they actually follow God's law. She was given because she understood God was still a blessing God, and she was coming to him in a needful way. And so it's all about our heart. And this scripture uh, that the commentator brings out the thought pattern that we want to be led of God. We want God to search and we want to do it God's way. So as we pull this together tonight, I want to challenge you as you go through this week to get close to God, hear his voice, and allow him to order your steps as you reach out, as you bless people, but most importantly, that we not forget what he's done for us. So next time we're going to go into God always keeps his promises. The Lord is your God and you are his people. Oh, what a wonderful section to know that he's faithful. I'm going to ask Bianca, if she doesn't mind, to close us out. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for this Bible study. Thank you for all those who have gathered here online. 
and who will gather later, Lord. We ask that you would just um, help us to hide these words in our heart, to not only be hearers of the word, but doers of your word. Help us to apply this to our lives, Lord, so that you might be pleased and that you might receive the glory. We praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, until we meet again, shalom.